The last few seconds, the launch count, there's a lot of dynamic things occurring on the shuttle. Things are powering up, uh, pumps, engines. You hear the engines kick on. You can see the large steam cloud rise. And then you hold your breath for a few seconds, praying that those solid rocket motors were going to go. And that six seconds seemed to last for an eternity because um, the vibration was so high, you could feel the shuttle just straining against the launch pad. You just, you think it's going to shake itself apart. And uh, let's hurry up and light solid rocket motors. Come on, come on, let's go. And then uh, bang at zero when the solids light. <laughs> kick on, you're going to go somewhere. Uh, the shuttle will not stay at the pad. What powers the thing is, is the absolute feeling and the love that the people have here at the center from the people that work with the wrench to the people that work with the paper, the people that really feel like they're almost physically pushing it off the pad, and their hearts go with it every time. And it's as if it's an absolute member of, of their family, if not a part of their, their being. It's very fast, it is very violent, it is very noisy. It's basically vibrations and noise. I'm scared of launches, I'm scared to death of launches. I really don't like doing them, but I accept them and I accept that risk. Uh, space is my calling. The vibration was so tremendous inside the cockpit that those gauges kind of blurred. It was like, well, it's a good thing I've trained so long to study these gauges I can't read them now. <laughs> In the space of about a minute and 45 seconds, we're traveling faster than the fastest rifle bullet. We're above Mach 3. What will we do if we lose an engine at this point? Will we return to Kennedy or will we continue to Africa? Uh, will we go to Spain? Or, you know, will we have to dump fuel from our orbital maneuvering engines if we lose an engine at this point or not dump fuel? And what orbit will we go to? And, you know, so there's all these things that you have to be staying ahead of the, of the vehicle on thinking if. If the next malfunction occurs, what do I do? After two minutes and 12 seconds, uh, you're off the silence and you're onto, onto the main engines. That's a smooth ride. It is a bit of a relief to know that they're gone. <laughs> and uh, you figure that the main engines have been working just fine for two minutes, no reason they shouldn't for another six. <laughs> so you're feeling pretty good at that point. It takes approximately eight and a half minutes of powered flight from a liftoff at the pad until you're going 17,500 miles an hour when you're on board. That's a very exciting ride. Goes by very quickly. When you're sitting in a management position, that is the longest eight and a half minutes in the world. I said, Ellen, Ellen, I can actually see the sky turning black. And Ellen said, great, and Don said, uh, what are the engines doing? And I came back in and I looked and I said, Don, the engines are great. Ellen, I can st it's really black now because I was so excited. The you OMICO know, is uh, a NASA acronym for a main engine cutoff, M-E-C-O, main engine cutoff. So uh, you always hear MECO and there's great smiles that go up in MECO, particularly if it's a safe MECO. <laughs> Closing my eyes just as the engine shut down, I was, of course, in free fall. It's rather abrupt from having a, a 3G push in which you weigh three times. I weigh roughly 460 pounds or so, uh, to zero G into free fall. Just a magical experience. <laughs> it's, I, you know, it's euphoria on board. It's euphoric. There's just the whole crew who lets up a cheer. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure if it's an unspoken thought in everybody's mind or 
or just sheer joy of being there, but it, it's certainly a little bit of both, you know? <laughs> we're alive and we're in orbit. <laughs> you know, I mean, what could be better? It's an archetypal dream of, of human flight. You know, we as humans, for as long as we've been humans, have thought about doing that. insurance salesman called me up. I surprised him. I said, yes, I am interested in life insurance, what he called. And uh, he said, oh, great. You know, I could tell you. It's, it's probably the one in a hundred that he'd got that day. And I said, how old are you? You know, and do you smoke? No, no. Good physical condition. Yes, yes, yes. You know, and great, great. And what's, uh, what's your occupation? And I said, well, I'm an astronaut. Dead silence on the phone. Without a doubt, the hardest part is what I do, and what I enjoy doing. Is it worth the risk to my family? Because I love my family dearly, and uh, I have three small daughters, you know, a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a six-month-old now, and, and uh, when you kiss them goodbye um, seven days prior to your scheduled launch as you go into quarantine, because you're not allowed to see your children in quarantine, uh, that's a difficult night. Uh, very difficult. I asked Danny a couple of weeks before flight, are you excited about your daddy going up in space? And she said, no. And I said, well, why not? She says, it might blow up. So Challenger is uh, still there in the forefront, I think. That's what I think of every time it goes up. And the boost of separation really bothers me. And my children, you know, laugh at me when we have a joke afterwards. But um, I jump every time. Seeing that shuttle going up is like amazing to me because you're watching all this um, power just push this tremendous um, shuttle into the air and it starts to hover, hover at first and it seems like that's the only thing you care about in the world right now. It's an incredibly dangerous business. You're turning loose so much energy in such a short period of time. Uh, you're using such sophisticated techniques and procedures and equipment. Uh, we're going to lose people. We're going to lose more people. I think it's only through the dedication of all the fine folks who work in this business we haven't lost more already. Personally, on that day, I was sitting next to the, to the person who had the responsibility for launch director. And, and we saw the Challenger destruct in front of us. And... Uh, it's a moment that those on the team and those that saw it, of course, will never forget. I was the flow director for Columbia at that period, and we had just landed out in California, and on the way back, I had stopped off in Denver to see my brother. So I was flying back that morning, and I, I hung around my brother's apartment watching the count, and they had a problem with the hatch, and they were talking about the problems with, with ice, and time was running I finally jumped in a cab and had to get to the airport and I get to the airport and of course in an airport everything's in the, so I called my brother real quick and I said how's it going and he said you have a problem and I said what do you mean he said a big problem the the last time I saw Crystal McCall she was very nervous about the uh, doing teaching the lesson from space I mean she was going to be live with hundreds of schools and she turned to me and said, I'm really nervous about all this video stuff. And uh, I was young and feeling very cocky that day. And I said, don't worry. We're going to take real good care of you. You don't have to worry about a thing. And I thought about that an awful lot. I was at my boss's office. We gravitate to some place where there's a television when it finally comes down to the last few minutes of the count. And uh, we were sitting there watching many secretaries and other people in the room at the same time and and when the spacecraft disappeared uh, in the explosion of course no one knew for sure what happened but they were saying uh, oh the SRBs have separated you know and and at that moment you could see a couple of SRBs wandering off on their own and 
my boss and I looked at each other, you know, and it was there was no words spoken. I mean, we just knew that uh, we were in deep trouble, that uh, that, that crew was gone.